Good afternoon. How are we feeling? It's been a good day so far? Yeah. Woohoo! We're all happy to be here at Games for Change. It really is an extraordinary couple of days where, where they're bringing together so many people across industry and functions who are thinking about XR and the ways that we apply it for social good and other purposes. We're really fortunate this afternoon um, to be joined by a truly esteemed panel with very distinctive perspectives on e XR funding. At the end of the day, it's hard to get anything done without any funding for R&D to develop the hardware, R&D to develop the software, and then clearly to develop the content. And essentially, as we were speaking before we came out here, we're sort of five years in in this modern incarnation of what XR slash VR, AR, MR, I don't know. We've got a lot of Rs going on here. We have language challenges, as I'm sure many of you are aware. But we are in this idea of producing 3D applications for a multitude of purposes. We are not that far in. We're really early days. I often liken it to a human being. If we say the average age is somewhere around 75 to 80 years old, we're probably about two, three, four years old, maybe five relative to human beings. We have a, a long way to go. So I'm going to introduce them very briefly, and then they're going to speak to us, each one of them is going to speak to us about what they're thinking about from the chair, from the seat at the table that they have. So to my right, right here, we have David Miller, Dr. David Miller, and he's from the National Institutes of Health, so he will speak from that perspective. Next to him, we have Chris Severson, who is from the Global Content Partnerships at HTC Viveport. Then we have Marcy Jastro, who's from Technicolor. And at the end, we have Steve Oyer, who is an investor. So I'm going to start with you, Chris. Talk to me about when you hear XR funding, what specifically are you thinking about? So I run the VR for Impact initiative at HTC. And what that means is we look for content that aligns with the UN SDGs. So I'm looking for anything that has real social impact along those lines. And I'm looking for a variety of content, whether it's something that ends up as an entertainment piece on Viveport, our digital storefront, all the way to something that's tool-based, that's actually used in the field and doing tech for good you know, at a, at a refugee camp or um, an animal sanctuary. So it kind of runs the gamut all the way from consumer to real-world tool-based VR content. Are you writing checks to support the creators who are making that content? We are writing checks. We are almost operate like our own NGO with an HTC, so we don't have a real huge budget. But we definitely fund things in the smaller range of under 50K and try to look for you know, several projects per quarter that we can fund small amounts. But then we also try to support via hardware seeding so that you get the dev kits that you need to actually create the content. Uh, we'll help with support at events for visibility, and we'll do a lot of marketing and amplification through our social channels. Marcy, you're nodding your head. <laughs> Why? What are you thinking about every day? You've been in this game a while at Technicolor in Los Angeles in a fabulous spot. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been quite the ride. Um, so I've been in this space for about five years now, and like everybody else, when uh, we jumped into this, we thought that XR, VR, AR, MR would be ultimately... Um, a tip of the spear for Technicolor to move into other areas. So anything other than entertainment and media. Creating proof of concepts that ultimately showed scale, at repeatability, and distribution. Um, because that's what we do, right? So Technicolor has been in the entertainment and media game for a very long time, whether through post-production, whether through visual effects, whether you know all of our brands are concentrating on very specific pieces. I look at um, using storytelling in this capacity to then push the medium forward. So it may be architecture, it may be medical, it may be, but really curating content that goes into multiple different verticals. What I learned early on is that you as the vendor um, or the work for hire company um, has many people coming to you. So it could be a director, could be a creative director, it could be a brand, it could be someone who's doing something for good. Everybody has something that they want to make, but it may cost a half a million dollars to make it. So you become the central point to create the ecosystem around one piece of content. So what does that ecosystem look like? You have to know everybody in the hardware side. You have to know everybody in the R&D side. 
You have to know how to create the content. You have to have a pipeline that actually builds that content. You have to have an activation. How are you gonna activate it? How are you gonna market it? How are you going to distribute it? Um, so what I think about today is not so much the home. I think of what an LBE scenario might look like, a location-based experience might look like. Why location-based? 99% of the world has never even touched a piece of goggle. Doesn't even know what it is. So the amount of people that you can get into a headset to get socialized inside that headset, set, get their aha moment, understand the impact it can have, um, that's what I look like. And then obviously monetization. Unfortunately, um, at this point, it's very hard to get monetization going. Um, every person you talk to, for the most part, wants some sort of ROI. So then we start modeling out how can you make money once you've released it to the wild. We want to hear more in a second about what that collaborative process looks like, because I think that's a key word for where we are in the evolution of these technologies. But first, Steve, talk to us about ecosystem building. Marcy just mention that very important <laughs> word. Where and where are you along that line and what are you thinking relative to these new technologies? I think we are in a you, very interesting time right now where the ecosystem is being built and IX Investments is not a fund but a permanently capitalized holding company that focuses on what is an underpinning philosophy by one of my partners called social value investing which means that capital is the catalyst that's gonna create positive social change, but partnering with government and the nonprofit world. So the idea of creating an ecosystem for games that have a positive intent in the VR, AR, XR world is exactly what we're doing through the founding of an accelerator to find the partners, which many of them I've just met today on this panel, <laughs> that will be creating the ability to monetize these games and scaling the impact and the return to investors. So the idea of having Games for Change, as Susanna spoke about earlier, as a partner, and this idea of a non-profit having intellectual capital that can be married with financial capital is exactly what we're trying to create in this space. And we'll talk more about that ecosystem. Trying to create some um, particular value. And I think, Doctor, you're thinking a lot about what that value is. But for you in your world, describe to us what that means. Yeah, so it's a little bit uh, different. I'm sort of here uh, representing my agency, the National Institutes of Health. But in a way, I'm also channeling my colleagues at the Education Department, um, at the National Endowment for Humanities, at Arts, so all the various agencies across the federal government. And uh, one thing that is uh, a bit unique is that some of our programs do have a focus on one particular area, one particular focus, and then others are sort of what you might call investigator-initiated uh, programs and investigator-initiated research. So you take the best idea of a VR experience you have in order to have impact in one area, whether it's arts and education or science and health or science and technology, and you can submit that in, and rather than trying to respond to one real specific RFP or one specific funding opportunity, your best idea will make it to the right part of the right federal agency. So that's pretty broad. <clears throat> Let's talk about the money. Steve had a good idea to ask you in the audience. How many of you have received funding to make XR? How many of you have received funding, angel, venture, or any other investment into an XR initiative or startup? So we got a bit of a mix in here. Yeah. How many of you would like to get some money for, <laughs> for an XR project initiative startup that you're thinking? Okay, so that's... All right, that's, so Dora, the real issue here is what in our premise is that this is a very underinvested marketplace. I mean, we we're talking that there's just been really massive change in the last five years on the hardware side, you know, on the software that enables the creation of, of the content and things like that, we believe that there will be more institutionalized sources of capital from the early to the late stage, and we're kind of committed to our own capital to starting to build part of that 
ecosystem. But what does that mean, though? Are you doing it in a traditional venture model where you're going to invest in a company that you believe will we scale want, we in such a way that you are going to get a 10x return on your dollar? Yeah, we, we, we're not a philanthropic group. We're focused on making money for our investors, but it's intentional capital. It's invested in things that we believe, because you can invest in a lot of different games, but Games for Change exists to encourage that positive side of gaming. So our intention is to deploy capital in things that have positive outcomes. But it's at the very early stage which we're developing our partnerships. It's an accelerator, which is a place where ideas that have some formation, say in the development phase, not just the idea that you're willing to look at at the NIH, but ideas that are in some formative stage, and then some that have a product that needs distribution. And we want to use our capital to accelerate their traction, their growth, and find strategic partners, find distribution markets for them. And it's really in three areas. It's in the mm -hmm. healthcare, medical space. Mm -hmm. It's in the education. It's in the financial literacy space. Mm -hmm. And those are marketplaces that are business if you would, to And those consumer. are mostly, and that's like on the enterprise side. Pardon? So that's more on the enterprise side. Right. So that's exciting to be thinking about there being more dollars that go into startups, but scaling that's going to take a really long time. And so let's just talk about the content. Let's get back to that idea, sort of the trajectory as we look forward. But Marcy and, and Chris, as we spoke about briefly before we came out here, for those of us who are content creators, getting your hand on money right now today so we can further understand how best to optimize these technologies in the content, whether it actually be for healthcare or for other entertainment, industrial, enterprise, and so on purposes. But particularly for content creators, it's tough. Marcy, what's your advice? Chris, what's your advice to people who are $150,000 sounds like a dream for a lot of the creators I know. But it's tough, right? Let's talk about where to get, where do I get the yeah. money today? I have an idea. Who am I looking at to try to get some traction, some motion, some forward motion on this idea that I have? You want to go? You want to go? Uh, so for, for me, because I'm also on the consumer end of content, we have the Viport store, which is where a lot of games are. Um, I've been, I'm starting to see now, especially like in the games for change space, that someone will build a game, it's just strictly you know, fun and games, and then they'll find a way to use those same assets in that game engine to actually turn it into a games for good uh, angle on things. For instance, we have a game that teaches people how to sail, and they, they gamify it, and it's, you know, it's, it's a fun experience. They're using that same game engine, those assets, to now turn it into like trash collection in the ocean, which becomes a VR for impact project that I, could, I can fund from that angle. So I'm seeing more of those sorts of things, which I think is a really good use to amortize you know, cost across a couple different verticals. But what do you say, because we all hear that, and everyone's like, oh, great, I'm going to send Chris a note. I'm working on this great project, and she's got money, and she writes checks. But I mean, for every pitch that you get, how many do you actually fund? And do you have anywhere to refer these people? I mean, are you referring them to Marcy? Do you say, hey, Marcy, check them out at Technicolor. Maybe they're writing checks. I mean, what? Do you have advice, or does that exist? I don't know. Yeah, I, I have advice. I, I mean, I think that you have to realize it's a tough space. So five years ago, uh, hardware companies were jumping on board all day long, giving up to $200,000, $300,000 for these projects. Um, then they were going the festival route, and they were moving through this system of what we thought we were building, this ecosystem of a way for people to see it. Then what happened in the market two and a half years ago, um, ultimately, there was no sustainable, repeatable distribution platform. Nobody was buying it for the home, so nobody was seeing it. So therefore, funding stopped, truly just stopped. And the reason why it stopped is there was no eyeballs. There was no way for people to see the content. So here, here's what I would say, and this is what I say a lot, and I even say it to myself because there's a lot of content I want to make. You have to look at storytelling as a medium and what is the best story that you're trying to tell? Right now, it's about how do you get a hold of as large swaths of audiences as you can. So whatever you are creating, it doesn't, you're not creating it just for VR, AR, or MR. 
You are starting at the very beginning of your activation. How are you activating the content? How are you gonna monetize it? It is a piece of content that can go across the entire value system as well, have, as, well as having a location-based experience because those are the kinds of things that are getting funded now. You wanna figure out a way to make money in the wild in location-based. You wanna do an upcharge on tickets. You then wanna get as many YouTube um, views as you possibly can. You then want to be able to put it into as many devices as you can. Is there a way to take that same content that's going in from VR, taking a piece of that content and moving it into AR? So it's putting it and distributing it across as many platforms as you possibly Who can. Who does that well besides maybe like Disney? Huh? Who else does that well besides maybe Disney? I, I don't think anybody's done it well. Um, I, I think that people are just starting to look at that now. Um, so again, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about the entertainment media. You know, all the studios came to us in the very beginning and said, "Look, we're making all of you know, we're making these high-end visual effects projects. We never take advantage of our assets. We want to be able to take that asset, and we now want to be able to put it in a VR project, an AR project, an MR project. Those assets, the way in which they were created, were not created for interactive. So you had to go back and you had to create these assets in a different way." So now it's a whole re-education re of teaching all types of content creators, independents as well as studios, to start thinking about it from backwards to forward. Start at the beginning, create the, keep in mind that you are creating for an entire different distribution model um, so that you are taking advantage of all of these new interactive ways. And so, David, what does that mean for you in your instance? Because you talked about working across sort of subject areas. Um, tell us what that means, and if you could give us an example of some sort of XR uh, engagement that you'd like to provide. Sure. So um, maybe I'll just talk about my own federal agency, the National Institutes of Health. So we have a focus on improving health outcomes, and that can be anything from basic biology up through treatment and diagnosis of disease, up to sort of implementation science of how you know, devices and technology are used in, our, you know, in America's hospital systems. Um, and as I said before, um, while we do have a commercialization arm, the real goal is impact. So there's no expectation that whatever um, you know, device or technology or research you do is going to have necessarily commercialization, an immediate commercialization potential. It's really more about what impact is it going to have in the biomedical research space for whatever kind of thing you're trying to do. I happen to be at the National Cancer Institute, so things that we might be interested in are sort of like, you know, remote, um, remote surgery devices. So, you know, you've got a clinician or a surgeon in one area, one location, you know, in a virtual environment doing surgery that a robot arm is working on somewhere else. Now, you might say, that's vastly beyond anything that my small company can do. Well, that may be true on the robotic side, but if you are, you know, an expert in the sort of, you know, interaction paradigms that have to happen that, you know, have very, very fine precision, or on sort of you know, getting the maximum amount of information, sort of a heads-up display, if you will, to the physician or to the surgeon um, uh, you know, doing the procedure, that might be a part where you can make an impact. So it's really, as you said and as others have said, it's about these kind of partnerships between you as content developers, technology developers, um, device developers, partnering up with um, you know, the clinicians or researchers or biomedical folks who have the sort of domain science expertise. Um, Pretty much anything, uh, in my view, that an XR developer is going to be involved in is inherently going to be a multidisciplinary type project. So, you know, searching out those handshakes, um, going into uh, you know uh, hospital systems and universities, interacting with folks at conferences like this or you know other um, even scientific conferences, if we're able to go to those, finding out what new partnership poss possibilities exist for you um, is key and. While I can serve sort of as a, uh, a bridge to that to a certain extent in saying, well, I know these folks are working on this or these folks are working on this, really the best way to approach folks like me in the federal government is just to say, here's my idea of an area that I might be interested in working on. Does that fit with your agency's mission or is that more Department of Education or is that more um, you know, National Endowment for the Humanities or Arts? Um, since we all interact um, throughout the federal government and all know each other and know each other's portfolios, we can usually direct you. So it's going to be one of those cases where a lot of times if you come up and talk to someone like me in the hallway, it's very likely that I'm not the person who's going to you know, be the person to directly um, lead you to funding, but it's very likely that I know the person or know the person who knows the person kind of a situation. So we're going to have a commercial break right now. 
um, which is to say I work for something called Our Lab, which is a New York City Economic Development Corporation initiative along with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. And part of our function, our focus is immersive tech, so VR, AR, and related technologies. We're 17,000 square feet in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and we've been around for seven months. And our focus is to do exactly what David and, and Marcy have mentioned to many degrees, which is to serve as a beacon for all those who are engaged in building this technology and making this content. There are all sorts of people in New York City, across the country, and all over the world who are engaged in furthering immersive technology, whether they're investors or they're creators or they're hardware manufacturers or they're in healthcare. Healthcare is such a huge bastion of activity around these 3D applications. We have sort of the, the godfather of it all, Walter Greenleaf, I believe. He's sitting right there. Please raise your hand. If anybody wants to know anything about healthcare and XR, that is mm -hmm. the person to ask. The purpose of our lab is to bring all of those people together to provide exposure and access to engaging in a variety of capacities, whether you're a startup, whether it's educational and training, having master classes on things like motion capture or volumetric or cloud processing, as well as working with corporations to engage and offer low stakes, high impact opportunities to learn about what this new technology is. We don't know what the best applications are. And it's interesting that you, I think all of us, we spoke about this before we came on stage, which is to say that the skill sets are very, it's the same. The same people who are making the games are gonna be making some of the healthcare applications. Some medical schools are getting rid of cadavers for first year medical students. They're using virtual simulations and 3D applications. Those are being created in part by people who have these digital expertise and being able to build environments and assets and also to make it work in perhaps a multi-user experience environment. So we absolutely, I would completely agree with David, encourage anyone with those skills or interests to make sure that you're connecting because there's no marketplace. Right, right well, Steve? I mean, there's no well, marketplace I, right I now to figure out like exactly. where the best investment is. You know, if you think about what makes a market, it's intellectual property, it's something that solves an inherent problem in an industry or from consumers or is fun, right? There's all kinds of different ways that products do something. But then the funding, what makes a market is the ability for capital to come in with the other partners and find a way to distribute it, make it into something that's investable. And what we've seen is that, you know, just to give an example, esports. Big, big money's going into esports right now. Why? Because people recognized the opportunity set, and all of a sudden, Ivy League schools are giving out scholarships, and there's this whole big uh, you know, ecosystem created for that arena. That's one big example. But if you're an early stage content creator, and you have this idea, that's what I think is coming next. Venture capital firms are starting to look at investing in games. Not from a social impact side, most of them, but just in games. And I'm talking about in the, in our parlance, in the B, C, you know, higher rounds as these companies need board funding. But I think what you see here, and with Games for Change, is the idea that early stage content that's consumer facing, like fun games that you were talking about. We, we'd love to see some fun games that have positive intent. Medical, you know, healthcare, education, financial literacy, all those things take big strategic partners to create the distribution that we've all acknowledged is not there yet. And we're chipping away. So that's our lab.nyc will increasingly You'll increasingly see things on the calendar and ways that you can plug in and potentially meet people from healthcare or from media or from other industries that have subject matter expertise, or maybe it's the converse. You are a subject matter expert who needs to meet up with a technologist who has an interest in your particular industry. So we're trying to cross-pollinate and bring people together, so definitely pay attention to that. So let's talk about 
advice for moving forward. One thing I'd love to hear from each of you is sort of what are the best resources that you look to? One of the, as we're evolving, one of the issues we have is how do we communicate with each other? Like how does somebody know that you might be running a contest? Or how does somebody know that Marcy, you're in the midst of creating some level of collaboration? And some of it might be public, right? Like what is the source that we might want to be looking to if we want to catch one of those you know, we're having a contest and we're giving away $100,000 or we're giving away $50,000 or we are looking for collaborators on X, Y, and Z. Where would, you, where would you suggest that people look? We want some actionable insights. Right, people? We want those? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I would, I would just say that if you're part of the groups and the meetups and the... It, we're not a very big group, honestly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's <laughs> the same 40, you know, 10,000, 15,000 people whenever I go to a conference. Um, the hope is is that we start scaling out into other verticals and we become these thought leaders within those other verticals as to why they should adopt um, these technologies. I, I want to back up for a minute. And sure. the reason why I want to back up is I want everybody to understand is we are still very early days. So I want you to go back to the internet. Some of you may have not even been born in 1997, but you know, a web page was, and I'm taking this from Jennifer, a friend of mine, Rendell, from Positron. Um, you know, way back then, in 1997, um, the web was being built, and people had websites, and what their websites consisted of was what their physical brochure was. They took a picture of that physical brochure, they stuck it on a web, and now you had a website. You couldn't interact with the content, it just was there. But you could search and find something. Um, and then you move to more... Oh, I'm going to build more interactivity into it. I may add in some e-commerce into it. I may update my website. Um, and then we went to applications for mobile, tying into the websites. So we're not even there yet. You know, we're, we're, we are still learning and getting multiple, multiple feedback. And, and, and we need the feedback in order to adhere what we should build. How do you build something that you think is going to be useful or you think that's going to change something? Yeah. How, do, how do we know that in your world of medical that anything that I build is actually going to help? <clears throat> well, nobody knew how you created that ecosystem, but you need the loops. You need to be able to go back around and understand what is working and what is not working. What I have found over putting people in headsets for the last three years, over 5,000 people, which may not sound like a lot, but it actually is. It's a lot. It's a lot of people. One at a time. Yeah, one at a time. <laughs> one person. That's a very long line if you sort of visualize that. Yeah, and I, and I think that it's about going to each different vertical, something that you're interested in, and seeing how you can make a change in that vertical. What are you doing? If it's for health, I know that I want to do something in health. I know I want to do something in education. And all of those things are going to change the way in which, not necessarily be the, the disruptor of it, but essentially looking at what will change it in baby steps. We're still in a crawl phase. And, and I think that, you know, yes, we really hope that, you know, the Quest, no offense, Chris, <laughs> um, and your new product will come out and it's untethered and people will feel comfortable. But you have to remember you're strapping things to people's face. It's giving them zero view of outside. So that's anxiety ridden. So you have to understand that you're at the beginning of these stages. And I, and I just always want to come back to that. And I want to come back to that because at the end of the day, you can build all the content you want. And guess what? 20 years from now, that content may not mean anything. So Adora, I can give a bit of insight as well for federal funding. OK, we want to um, hear that. If there's one rule to go by, whether you're interested in the biomedical space, education games, um, culturally you know, significant uh, you know, museum pieces, anything of the sort, seek out and talk to your program director. Um, as I said before, we... You mean the program director and the very... At whatever particular agency. agency. And even if you okay. don't know, you're, by all means, send me an email. Um, Ed Metz is going to be here later on tomorrow talking about his classroom technologies program at the Department of Education. He has a half dozen other colleagues that are interested in other aspects of education, K through 12 and beyond. Um, there are several different versions of me at the NIH. We're only allowed to send one of, one of us each to each of these meetings. So there's a colleague that focuses on STEM games for education that have an impact on health. 
I focus more on these sort of you know overall biomedical research focus type grants. And there's other that focus on you know just children or just other aspects of it, right? So as a as a bridge to understanding what are the potential funding opportunities, um, or even if it's just I have a very very nascent idea. Here's the space that I work on. Here's the type of content that I've developed before. Would this make sense as sort of a child education? Uh, you know, application or tool, would this make more sense in terms of like actually being useful in a, in a clinical setting, but I don't know how to talk to, you know, sort of clinicians, what, what advice or help could you give with that, and then what funding opportunities might be relevant to that. That's our job as program directors across all these various federal agencies is to help you find. So like transportation, comp, or like any of, because there's applications. Yes, like Across yeah. any. Yes, and you'd be surprised at what, at what at, at the various avenues that you could pursue, right? If, if you're teaching someone about an aspect, if you're trying to actually have impact on that particular aspect, or if you're trying to um, you make, a, make a tool that can be used in producing new ideas for that, or even just if you, I've got a virtual environment, a collaboratory where people can meet and come up with new ideas, even tools, uh, computational tools, um, uh, like that uh, could be of relevancy. So it's really just get in contact, mm -hmm. reach out. Don't, don't you know, Google a few times, not find anything, and then give up. That's good. Yeah, That's the, good. The, the most frustrating thing for me, I, I see so many amazing concepts, and I can't fund them all, and I don't know where to refer people, like to a exactly. consultancy of sorts. And that's exactly what's needed because a guy. I'm not a medical expert. He's I'm not an educational expert. <laughs> so to be able to have some kind of you know consultancy to like refer amazing projects that I can't fund for whatever reason and have a place for those people to go yeah. and find funding is great. And the other thing you'll get when you talk to a program director or investment um, folks is that you'll learn, well, if I'm going to go the grants route, does this fit with my sort of company's business model, right? A typical grant takes a year to go through peer review and everything else, and your company may not you know, have the resources to remain, remain in business that long. So if after talking to some investment folks, you learn there's a bit more of an immediacy or some sort of initial startup funds to get you going, that may be the route that you want to go. But you're not going to know that, and you're not going to know that that fits with your company's business model or your you know, uh, you know, approach that you take as individuals until you actually reach out and talk. I would so, suggest just two quick sources. Um, One is nextreality.com, uh, which is a pretty good site. It just, they cover the space pretty well, and they generally, uh, you can get an idea, like when the big companies have announced some sort of competition or some sort of grant program, often there. The other thing is I would say for those of us here in New York City or even in San Francisco is Gary's Guide. Dot com. He does a phenomenal job of listing like all of the events that are taking place, often listing competitions and other potential sources of funding. So there's a lot in there because he's covering the entire startup ecosystem in New York City, but it's worth like your five or 10 minutes to go through it um, if you're looking for funding, potential funding opportunities. Lucian. Steve, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Steve. You know, when you invest in um, early stage ideas, and content, you're really investing in people. And this, if there's an, the skill or the art to it is understanding the passion and what the people that are creating the content and the idea have and translating, helping them translate that into an economic model for success. So an accelerator, as we're putting together, is kind of a process to take in many, many ideas and look at a lot of teams and either find the few that we can fund and scale that or have somebody to refer them to. Somebody that they may be so early that they need to, to come into a grant to form something further from the idea stage. But one of the things that we're learning, and we have a partner along with Games for Change in this accelerator called Quake Capital. And they're based in New York, Los Angeles, Seattle, Austin, Texas, and soon to be overseas, they look at thousands of early stage companies. And after a while, you begin to see patterns and you look at things and the skill builds. That's the same thing we're hoping to build on. And some of the best ideas that Quake gets because they're actually gonna be running the accelerator and putting the programs come from universities. And I believe the partnerships with universities and all the props to Walter, who I just met today, who, the small world funny story, I said, Walter, I'm doing research on medical companies in the VR, XR space. And one of my colleagues identified nine companies. I showed him the list, and he said, oh, I'm involved with five of them. Mm -hmm. 
So that's a resource that, that is really there and based at Stanford. So I think that there's resources on this panel, there's resources in cities, in governments, and in universities, and it's really about getting the capital to the right ideas with the right process. And we are, our lab is actually a consortium of NYU, Columbia University, CUNY, and the New School, to your you point. I think we've talked about what some of the challenges are. It's early days, um, and we've, it's early days, the technology is still evolving, the application is evolving. We've talked about the federal government as a potential source. We've talked about there are some venture capitalists who are seeing new opportunities potentially moving forward, especially since I think we would all agree that the technology has been iterating pretty quickly. Those headsets are changing pretty quickly. That merging between VR and AR is coming pretty quickly. I saw a Finnish company a couple of weeks ago, Varja. I don't know if any of you have, have tried their headset. Extraordinary how seamlessly it moved from VR to AR. And we see the software, right? Technicolor, Adobe, everyone, many of the big players as well as others creating software that makes it easier to make some of these 3D applications through mobile. On this last question, because we just have a few minutes left, I'd love to hear from each one of you what you are most excited about right now, um, today, as you look ahead at this, at these new technologies and what they could provide for us. David, I'm I'll excited. just start with you and we'll go sure. down. Sure, I'm, I'm excited about the new partnerships that can form, right? Um, my agency funds all types of you know, data analysis, informatics type software, that sort of, you know, for years and years has been honed and focused on let make it make it the most, you know, computationally intensive and you know optimized algorithms that are underlying all this. And there was never really much thought for the user at the end of the day, right? Who's going who, whose hands are this going to be in? I think there's now a fantastic opportunity for folks to bring your you know, XR experience, your game development experience, your UX, your UI design experience to these tools to dramatically improve their impact whether they're in the hands of clinicians, bench biologists, researchers, or whoever, students in education. Um, so forming these partnerships, I think, is going to be a key, key event. Are you funding things right now that we can pitch to Yes, so, so as, as I say, Please do every that. agency that I've, that I've mentioned you know, has funding opportunities that are tailored for very specific areas that you can search through. There are resources like you mentioned. I think Lucian Parsons has his Maverick uh, funding opportunity listserv that you can join if you want to. That's free for everyone at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, and like I say, we have a focus, over 60% of what my agency funds is investigator-initiated research. You're not responding to a particular honed in, we want VR technology for X, Y, Z. It's send us your best ideas that impact human health and we will figure out where it would land and you know, what program directors you would work with. Chris? Uh, for me, it's a couple things. Uh, one is working with various NGOs, all of like who are increasing their interest in seeing how empathy building can really impact their you know, attention level and, and calls to action. And HTC loves partnering with those sorts of people because that helps us with our visibility. We, there's a real synergy. Uh, so those partnerships, if you have someone on board on your project, we love to see that. That really helps us tick our boxes. And then the other thing is, not to make a plug for HTC hardware so much, but the eye tracking with the Vive Pro Eye. I see so many amazing projects built on that, as just as far as data collecting and learning how people look at things and where their attention is, I think it's just gonna explode in a lot of different ways and really open up a lot of new ideas for projects that really are impactful in research, data collecting, empathy building, all of that. Marcy? Um, I'm interested in the business enterprise side of it. Um, I think that we forget that even though we're an enterprise, we're still doing, um, we're still a consumer. And so the more that you are using this hardware to, um, for tools within your workplace, and then you start seeing an entertainment factor to it, you may go home and then start building a home ecosystem. So I think that um, enterprise is really exciting, and I think location-based. I think you're going to see a whole different world start popping up of places to go to that are not arcades that they will be in museums, they will be in places where there's large football, and I think the sociability of it will be really interesting. Steve? So, I'm, I'm looking at this for the next two to three years where what excites me so much is to be able to build a business that has the resources to have collaborative partners like the ones on this stage and scale some of these games and prove the success model. 
because success attracts success. Capital will move towards things that have proven business models. It takes companies and entrepreneurs to put their feet in the, in the ground and, and stand there tall and say, we're going to invest for the future. And I believe that's what's going to happen here. You're going to see some of these ideas that may be in this room today grow into companies that are accepted by the consumer, that are accepted and reimbursed by Medicare in the health field, that are reimbursed by health insurance companies that can get to scale. And for us, it's about having the ability to see that impact that's created by the capital and the entrepreneurs scale to do positive social things with partners like Games for Change and Quake. I, I said that was the last question, but I actually have one last tiny question. If any of you would like to, it's totally optional, like to share with us like what your favorite game or VR or and or AR experience is. I'll go first since I asked the question. <laughs> I love Super Hot. Anybody played that game? Yes. <laughs> I love Wonderscope. Anybody tried that? It's an AR app. It's really awesome. It's voice activated. It's a little child's uh, app, app. It's worth experimenting with. I really like the, the spatial, the design, the resolution, and the responsiveness with the voice. It's pretty cool. So it's, 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 it's a good little app if you want to check it out. Anybody else? Any particular thing that you like? Go ahead. So there's a game called Snowman. And some, of you, some people I, may have seen it. And it's the ability to be in a virtual world with the abominable snowman throwing snowballs which is exciting and everything, but it's used, and it just, I hate to say this, but it gave me chills when I saw the, the demonstration. It gives the ability for somebody who's going through treatment on their, in the physical world to actually reduce the pain level and changes their body temperature and all these things. And I just, it, it blew my mind. I grew up in the 60s and 70s. It blew my mind to see the possibilities of something that was non-invasive you know, that could change somebody's treatment. So that was so exciting. And I know there's a lot of other ones like that. My favorite health game at the moment is probably still Philo. I, I love that game with yeah. Jerome Waldespiel and others at McGill University. It's a DNA alignment game where they've taken all the science and sort of put, uh, taken that away. You don't need to know anything about how you know, disease um, and evolutionarily um, you know, evolves across species. And you know, right, instead, it's just this game where you can pop in, pop out, play a little bit. And even if you just do one or two sessions, you're having an impact on human understanding of disease. I love something that we launched on Viveport a bit ago called Tribe XR. And you get to be a DJ. Like, you learn how to, how to be a DJ in VR. And they have like live sessions with like really famous DJs that you can sign up for. And you really come out learning how to be a DJ, which I think is amazing. Um, I like you love super hot. Um, Beat Saber is a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think yeah, we yeah. all, that sounds so cliche, it's funny. Um, but I also like Run-In. And I like Run-In, which is um, interesting because I think that it takes use of where we sit in the creation of content today in volumetric capture and in a creative way not make it look like uh, they were trying to, to be perfect. And I think that that's the other thing you need to realize in this game is nothing really has to be perfect at this point. All right, well, we certainly hope that you've taken away one or two or three thoughts from our panel this afternoon. Obviously, there will, we will be continuing to have lots of conversations about XR funding and what that means and how we, we go about it. I want to thank you, Steve, and Marcy, and Chris, and David for joining me this afternoon. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much, and thank, thank you. you for joining us all. <laughs>